بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم آمين Thank you everybody for coming. It's an honor to be here today and it's an honor to have these two uh, incredible guests with us, alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm really excited today because, um, you know, I feel like one of the really great, beautiful things about being Muslim is just sort of getting to know our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters and hearing their stories, uh, learning from it and increasing in brotherhood and sisterhood. So we have a really great opportunity to do that today with two very special people. Um, and, uh, you know, I know a little bit, but I don't know a lot of it. And so I'm really excited myself to learn more. And I think everybody's really going to, uh, benefit from it and, um, find it very interesting, inshallah. So, uh, I'm not going to introduce our guests because basically this whole session is for them to introduce them, themselves to us. And we're going to get to really know them a lot better. So we have sister uh, Amber Leibrock here with us and brother Mujib Hamid or MJ, uh, here with us as well. Um, so we'll start with uh, Sister Amber. If you could just basically just set the stage for us. Tell us a little bit about like, you know, how and where you were born, your family situation, how you grew up. Um, there you go. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Amber Librock. Um, I was born in Hayward, California. I was born and raised right here in Hayward, California. Lived there my entire life. Um, and yeah, when I grew up, I didn't come from a very religious background, uh, where I grew up was kind of rougher. It wasn't as bad as some places out here in the Bay, but you know, it wasn't the best. Um, I grew up with a mom who was, um, an addict and she also suffered from, um, just some kind of uh, like abusive tendencies to her children. Um, so I, I, I grew up a little bit rough with my mom. And when I was eight years old, my father unfortunately passed away. So I um, was raised by my grandma and my grandma, uh, alhamdulillah, was there for me and she took care of me and she raised me to the best that she could. Um, but my grandmother worked two jobs when I was growing up. So it left me with a lot of time on my own. And my mom was kind of in and out of my life. My mom was very young when she had me. So, um, she was around and she wasn't around. She was around and wasn't around and she ended up starting to have my brothers. And so I have three wonderful brothers, um, who we all kind of grew up the same. And, um, when I was kind of left to my own vices because my parents weren't around and my grandma was, uh, working two jobs, I unfortunately ended up doing what some kids do and turn to the streets and kind of turn to some bad group of people. Well, they weren't bad groups of people. They just weren't doing the best of things, you know? So I, Went through that little adventure of my life, kind of growing up in gangs and, you know, violence, um, the same way I grew up when I was a kid. And then I started losing a lot of my friends to gun violence and um, different kind of violences of that way. So I was like, you know, let, let's just switch this whole thing and let's party instead because that's so much better for you right so then i ended up kind of venturing off into that world where i unfortunately developed my own addictions um with alcohol and drugs and uh ended up losing a lot of friends in that lifestyle as well whether it was from overdoses or unfortunately a lot of suicides in um my life and yeah. And so all of that brought me to a person who I dated for a very long time. I actually met them in the party scene and they were already a professional fighter. And that is how I found fighting. And when I found fighting, I, um, started to clean up my act and I became an athlete and I started to, um, yeah, just clean up my act and, and do some better things, make some changes. I got clean. I got off of drugs. I got off of alcohol and I had some really good runs and I eventually ended up going pro. And yeah, that's where our stories will eventually intertwine. 
So you said you had three, three, three brothers. Yes, are, I you, have three are you the eldest? I'm the oldest. Yeah. Okay. So I'm the oldest, and then I have Joseph, Michael, and Matthew. Joseph's about thirty right now. Matthew is twenty three, and my youngest brother is twenty one. Just turned twenty one. Um, my brother Matthew lives with me, and my other two brothers live in Idaho, where my mom and my stepfather moved. Um, so when my mom had my youngest brother, my youngest brother was severely sick. He had holes in his heart, and he had this disease where his heart beat. Um, it went like double the speed it should have. So it, it went really, really fast per minute. And like you used to be able to see it like beating out of his chest. But alhamdulillah, because that is what forced my mom to get clean. So when my mom ended up having my little brother and he was so sick, she was like, wow, like I can't like leave this for anybody else. I have to kind of take control. Um, and she had been with my stepfather Pretty much the year my dad died, she met my stepfather, who um, unfortunately was in and out of the jail system. So when they had my littlest brother, my mom ended up getting clean. My stepfather got out of prison, and they both decided that they were going to change their life. And when they decided to change their life, they all moved to Idaho. And I ended up staying here with my grandmother. And um, right now, to this day, me and my mom are good. So, you know, I tell the story and I want people to also know the other side, but my mom changed, you know, her life and my mom really has come a really, really long way. And her and I have fixed our relationship and, you know, forgiveness comes from, you know, within and forgiveness comes for the person, not for the other person, you know, forgiveness is for self. And, you know, that's what her and I did. I, I ended up forgiving her and, letting it all go and her and I now have a beautiful relationship. That's incredible. Um, yeah. So if you reflect back on like the earlier time you, you were saying, like this sounded like you were saying you, you got into like gangs and, and like, like, uh, you know, maybe good, good people, maybe doing not the best things. Yeah. What were the sort of the reasons you ended up in that space? You feel like, well, I think where I grew up in Hayward, all of us were kind of dealing with the same thing, whether our parents were on drugs or they were abusive or, you know, one of our parents had passed away at a young age. So it just ended up being a group of kids that didn't really have nowhere to turn. Like we had nowhere to go, but with each other. And in Hayward, in like certain parts of the Bay Area, like gangs are a big thing. And, and when you don't have a family at home to turn to, you turn to something that's similar to a family. And, you know, they do, they accept you, they love you, they want to take care of you. Like sometimes it comes at a price, you know, but so I think it was just a bunch of kids looking for love in all the wrong places. And it just happened to be there, you know, on the streets, just trying to find a purpose, trying to find, you know, something to just help us all keep going. And then, and then you said the next stage was you sort of decided to leave that. What, how old were you when that happened, when you made the transition out of that? I was game? about, uh, like 21. So I was about 20, 21 when I, um, was like, you know, I'm losing a lot of friends to the gun violence. I had met this girl who was like, Oh, you got to come with me. Like, I'm going to take you somewhere. It's going to be so much fun. And at the time it was, it was a lot of fun at first, but it all came, the fun didn't last, you know, because then you start to de develop your own problems and your own addictions. And then you really start to face your own traumas and your own just, you know, skeletons in your closet and drugs and alcohol don't do anything but highlight the bad parts. You know, it feels good for a second, but they really just, at the end of the day, just highlight all the bad parts and everything you're running from and everything you're trying to fix and all those things, you know, and at the time I knew nothing of religion. You know, my mom would sometimes get clean and then, you know, we studied with some Jehovah Witnesses and we studied with Seventh Day Adventists, but nobody ever really explained religion to me. You know, it was just a, always a new group of people and, you know, a Bible study here, a Bible study there, but nothing was religious based. So there was no like, who do we turn to, you know, and so. And then, so the, you made the transition to sort of you said the more like a partying instead yeah. of like the gang type stuff. Yeah. 
and um, I guess then you you said you met somebody who introduced you to the fight. Yeah, okay. yeah. So in, in the midst, I I ended up meeting a lot of people through like this six year span, and I was about. 24, 25, when um, I think it was like 24, when I met my, my, this person who introduced me to fighting cause they were already a pro fighter. Um, and I did end up meeting them through party scene because we knew a lot of people in the same scene and they were, even though they were a pro fighter, they were struggling with a lot of their own alcohol abuse, which now they're clean and sober for many, many years, alhamdulillah, oh, wow. um, and still fighting. But yeah, so that's kind of how we met. And then I knew nothing of fighting. I knew nothing of sports. I was never an athlete. I was never anything of those sorts. So when I first started training, um, I was just kind of doing it to stay in shape and fitness and just, you know, lose weight and just, you know, be a part of their life a little bit. And then they ended up breaking up with me and I was devastated, right? Like, oh, my, like, what am I going to do? So I just stayed in the gym and someone was like, you know, you should really try jujitsu. And I was like, Oh, well, I don't know anything of, of jujitsu. So, okay, I'll try some jujitsu, put on the gi, started training jujitsu. And then people were like, Oh, we want you to be like aggressive. Like, you know, like go out there. And I was the only girl at this jujitsu school at the time. And I was like, you want me to be a great, they're like, yeah, like beat the boys, you know, like get them. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> I started to learn more jujitsu and, you know, I started to kind of chant. That's where I learned that, oh, I can channel this energy I have and do something good with it and not, um, you know, run amok or, you know, make bad choices. And then I started competing. And when I started competing, I started winning. And of course you win a bunch of stuff. It just kind of like in tight, what win or lose doesn't matter, but I did. I started winning. I started doing really, really well, winning big jujitsu medals at, you know, white belt, blue belt. And then that's how I snowballed into actually doing MMA. So did you stop using substances like alcohol, drugs and stuff while you were, when you started training? It took me about a year. a year. So it took me a year and it wasn't really until I kind of got away from the first team I trained with and with the team I'm at, you know, with MJ's gym now with, um, my other coach, coach Kiri and his best friend, they that own CSA together, but it did, it took me a little bit of time to kind of like transition from one to the other. And, um, it really wasn't until my second fight as a pro, that was a loss. It was a really, really bad loss. Um, you know, I got beat up pretty much for three rounds and, um, that was when I decided like, if I'm going to do this, I have to give it my all. I cannot mess around anymore. I need to, you know, start doing myself some favors and get rid of everything that's holding me back. So that's when I finally was like, okay, no more. And um, that was what, 10 years ago. And I haven't done anything since. So, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Mashallah. That's amazing. Um, so, Brother MJ, Brother Rajiv, same question to you. Just kind of tell us a little bit about how you grew up, where you were born. Should be. I think you might have turned it off. Yes. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Rajiv. I go by MJ. Um, my life is pretty, you know, something similar to probably a lot most of you guys. You know, I was born in Afghanistan and, you know, Came here when I was six years old, and with my uh, with my mom, with my uh, auntie, and my little brother. Um, unfortunately, my uh, my father and my uncles were all in uh, prison camps at that time. You know, during the war. Um, so when we first came to this country, we came alone. Um, we escaped from Afghanistan into Pakistan, and then from Pakistan to here. You know, um, fortunately, they were, you know it was. It was very hard, you know. The the smugglers who were trying to smuggle us into Pakistan decided to leave my mom and my um, and my um, my auntie and my and my brother. So we found our way somehow into uh, Afghanistan, and then from that point on, we uh, my uh, my uncle and my dad and everybody they escaped from uh, the prison camps uh, when they were held by the Russians, and they made it to Pakistan. And then somehow, some way, you know, one of my uncles ended up here and 
sponsored us and we ended up in uh, America. So uh, I kind of lived a, a, a pretty uh, rough life as well too, um, similar to what, uh, you know, Amber, uh, but not as rough as Amber's. Um, but, you know, I grew up uh, in, in with gangs and, you know, I grew up with, you know, in the Fremont area and, you know, just like a lot of our Afghans and Pakistanis and uh, uh, Muslim brothers and sisters that, you know, grew up in Fremont. Um, I was a little bit more heavily involved in, in, in those, in those sectors. So, um, but I had a uh, pretty good reputation and everybody knew that not to mess with me, you know? So even back then, so not a lot of people mess with me back then. So, um, growing up, you know, a lot of fights, get into a lot, a lot, a lot of fights. So, um, let me ask you a little bit back, back up to the Afghanistan part. So you, you were where in Afghanistan were you born? I, I was born in Kabul. In Kabul. And yeah. then how old were you when you made the path to Pakistan? Uh, six years old. Six. six years old. So about five, six years, between five and six years old. Cause you know us, we don't know our birthdays pretty much. You don't know. They said you're a Virgo and I'm like, I think so. Yeah. I'm a Virgo. What were you born? September 1st? Pretty sure that's when I was born. Yeah. <laughs> So you don't act like a Virgo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when what you said when they were the the people who were smuggling you into Pakistan, yeah. they left behind your your mom and your auntie. No, they left. He left all of us behind. He took the money and he left. Oh he was wow! Gone. So he just took the money and left. He left the money. He he got us a little further into thing, and I remember us uh, hiding inside the tanks and on the side of the tanks and wow. everything like that. Yeah. So it was that. That's that. That was those are the parts that I I. I remember very well. You can still remember those. Yes, one hundred percent. I can remember those parts very well. Just trying to get to the other to the other end, and it's and it's unfortunately it's it's similar to what what's going on right now. You know, we see in Gaza and you know in a lot of other places. You know, they're working their way through, and it's similar. There's no social media back there, obviously back then, but you know, it's it's pretty similar to what you know what the uh, our brothers and sisters are going through right now. So, you were six years old. You said you and your mom, and your auntie. Yep, me, and my auntie, and my brother. Yeah, and your brother is yep. your brother older than you? Or? My brother's younger than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. my brother's younger than me. Yeah. And then, how did you eventually actually make it to Pakistan? Uh, some, I, you know, somehow, some way, one of my uncles came to get us from across the border. Okay. Somehow, he some was way, in Pakistan already. He was in Pakistan already. Okay. So, I, we we don't even know how we ended up with him, but we just ended up with him. Subhanallah. Yeah. So even my mom, you know, unfortunately my mom can't talk anymore because she had a stroke uh, about 10 years ago. So from the times when she would tell us, it would tell us, she's like, I, I, we, we don't know how it happened, but it happened. So she can't even explain it. Or she couldn't explain it back then. So so once you get to Pakistan, where do you stay? Uh, we stayed in Peshawar. In Peshawar. Yep. In how, Peshawar. And you were in Peshawar for how long? Uh, two, years. two years. Two years. Two years okay. in Peshawar. Yep. So do you speak uh, Urdu and no? no. <laughs> <laughs> I did at the time. I remember. Yeah. I, I remember. You know, speaking full fluent Urdu. Okay. You know, because my mother was a teacher, my father was a principal. So, um, and yeah, that's that's how we. Yeah, I think you were telling me before you speak Pashto and I speak Pashto right? and Farsi. Yes, Pashto. Yeah. yeah. So, so then when you're eight years old, that's when you come to the U.S. We, I was about yeah five between five to six. You know, like I said, I who knows. Yeah, but <laughs> you, know? you, you spent two years in Pakistan. Two years in Pakistan, and then you come to, and then you come straight to the Bay. Straight to the Bay. And you straight to Fremont. You go to Fremont. Okay. Right. I, th I don't remember what I think I said. Oh, that's yeah. yeah. I don't <laughs> think Oakland Airport existed at that time. Yeah, so. probably not flights from Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> and then so you so you land in Fremont. Yeah. Yep. And that's what you were saying. Kind of the environment was yes. you know, lots of gangs and. Yeah, you know, it, it, the thing was, was, you know, uh, being on, you know, government assistance, being on, you know, welfare, food stamps and housing and all that kind of stuff, you're, they're not going to put you in the, in the best areas. You're not going to be able to afford the best areas. So guess what? You ended up in one of the worst parts. Fremont at that time was okay, but you ended up in the bad parts of Fremont because your parents can't afford a nicer home. So that's where we ended up in downtown central and you know, it wasn't the greatest, you know, the, the, the back then the Crips and the Bloods, one street over, you know. So and then they would come over from Hayward and they would come over from, you know, Oakland. So fights would break out all day long. So yeah. So then how did you 
so you're you growing up in in uh, in Hayward. You have you have a little brother, right? So you're trying mm-hmm. to yeah. take care of him. Yeah. And then, how do you eventually get into uh, like martial arts? So um, my journey was a little bit later. You know, going through a lot of stress in life, dealing with a lot of stuff, and you know, I I really again wanted to not get into more fights. You know, so I decided to jump into kung fu. So you don't want to get in fights, so you do kung fu. Kung fu. Okay. I wanted to let my aggression out of it. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> so, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, and ended up with not the greatest coach in the world, but, you know, um, it, it made me realize a lot of things in life. So, you know, um, then I took my aggression out there, okay. you know, so versus out on the streets. Yeah, so. You got to, you know, get into fights in a gym to okay. not fight on the streets. Right. It's, just, it's science, yeah. really. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Because if I know you train Kung Fu, I'm not going <laughs> to like in the message. So you, you, did you feel like that worked? Like it was a stress relief one, for you? And absolutely. Uh, okay. Absolutely. It honestly was one, you know, uh, was one of the best things, one of the best decisions I ever made. And, you know, mom and dad's prayers really, 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 I, you know, now that you think back, you're like, those are mom and dad's prayers. You That's know, they want, problem. they didn't want you in that environment. They didn't want you living that life. So you would see them crying and, hurting because they wanted you to have that education. They wanted you to, you know, do something with yourself. But, and I think that that's what led me to there. Then that's what led me into the fitness industry. And then that's what led me to, you know, uh, owning a gym. That's what led me into being in the finance world, understanding stuff. So, you know, so I think these are the steps that Allah has taken, you know, um, you know, the, 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 um, you know, the fights on the streets, you know, dealing with stealing cars, you know, um, you know, I wouldn't say I don't, I never robbed anybody, fortunately, but, you know, stealing cars and, you know, going out partying, going to clubs, all that. So, you know, it was one of those. So t- take us through that journey a little bit. Like, so you, from Kung Fu, and then we know now, Hamid Ali, inshallah, you have a very successful, uh, you know, combat sports academy, but how did you get, how did you get, from just training in Kung Fu to that, you know? Um, again, the, the, the fight world, you know, um, dealing with a lot of a lot of stress, a lot of home stress and all that stuff. Going from Kung Fu, I met um, now today my best friend, you know, my business partner. You know, I was working out a 24-hour fitness one day and I was just going through it, you know, and I was commuting. I was all over the place, you know. I didn't have an issue working, making money, I was financially good. But emotionally and mentally, I was trying to find myself, you know? So I met my partner and my best friend today, which is, you know, one, uh, uh, Amber's coach, you know, and my coach at that time, he became my coach, so I fought for him. So he's like, you know what? I see something in you, MJ. I see something in you. And and and, and I went, I, I was like at 25 Fitness, and I'm like, I really like that shirt you're wearing, you know? And it just, he's just like, oh, you do? He said, oh, I was like, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite fighters. I'm like, well, I want to, um, I, I, I would love to come and train with you. I, he goes, yeah, come and train with me. He's like, but I'm all the way in San Jose. Can you make it? I was like, I don't care where you're at. <laughs> and funny enough, the guy that went with me is actually here today. I, didn't, I just saw him right now. <laughs> he's actually here tonight. He went with me my first time. Surprisingly, I didn't know he was here. But he, was, he, he went with me my first time. When I met my partner, we both we both trained together that one day. And on that point, I, I wouldn't say in a, in a bad way, but I fell in love with my uh, my current you know business partner. You know, we became best <laughs> friends, and you know we are we are legitimately inseparable. You know, and we fight like cats and dogs. We argue, we laugh, <laughs> we joke, we do we do everything. You know, so you, you were saying you fought for him. So was that is that MMA yeah, or I fought kickboxing? Kick I did Muay Thai for him. Muay Thai, yeah, Muay Thai okay. for him. So I fought a few times, and you know, and uh, my first ever fight, my first ever fight, um, it was in Las Vegas, and I was, I was like, you know, and I'm this tough guy, you know, and you know, I fought in the streets, and you know, and I'm like, this is no problem for me, you know. He's like, okay, you need to lose ten pounds, though. I'm like, I need to lose ten pounds. <laughs> he goes, yeah, you're not at weight right now. And he's like, well, you have a week to do it. I was like, he's like, don't make me, when you get to Vegas, make you lose 10 pounds because that's going to be even harder. So obviously me, you know, 
being who I am, you know, I was like, oh, I'll get it done, whatever, no problem. You know, I get to Vegas, I'm 11 pounds overweight. Oh, man. <laughs> so he's like, all right. He made me put a sauna suit on. He made me run outside in 120 degree weather to get me to lose. And he followed me in a car on the streets while I'm running, falling, while eating Wendy's. He, you, he was eating Wendy's. He was eating okay. Wendy's. And his, what he does, he does, now I'm addicted to Diet Pepsi because he's, you know, and we always fight because I used to do the Diet Coke. And he used to do the Diet Pepsi. Yeah. So while he's drinking his Diet Pepsi, he followed me in the car eating a French fry. You know? Nice. You know? So <laughs> get to the fight night. I lose my weight. So you made weight. I All made right. weight. And I get to the fight, and I'm just like, okay. You know? I'm ready to do this. And all of a sudden, my heart rate goes up. I'm, like, I'm not doing this. I, I'm not ready. I don't want to fight. He goes, what do you mean you're not fighting? I'm like, <laughs> Okay. He pulls me aside. I'm like, I can't fight. I'm not ready. He goes, he goes, no, you're ready. He goes, I said, no, I'm not ready. I walk out. He grabbed me and he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm leaving. <laughs> he grabs me. He slaps me in the face. Oh, he goes, he's like, you are one of, to this day. He tells me, he goes, you are the one and only fighter I have ever slapped. You know, he slapped me so straight. That I went out there and I fought and I knocked the guy out in the first round. Yeah, he's never hit me. He's never hit me. So you so think that's an MJ? Okay, that's only <laughs> that's an MJ for sure. Yeah. So it was one of those. Yeah. So that was and then I met. So that was a slap that started a partnership that started, started a partnership combat sports together. Right? That exactly started the partnership about a year later, you know, and it's been love at first sight ever since. I was <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it was. It, it's been it's been an amazing journey, um, and we built that place to inspire people, bring people like Amber and multiple others. You know, um, uh, Amber is not the first convert to come out of Combat Sports Academy. Amber is the, the the third, the third one to come out of Combat. We had another fight, female fighter, um, Jenna, which we did her Shada here as well too. She moved back to New Zealand or wherever she's at in New Zealand, yeah. And then another friend of mine who was training over there as well, too, and he's an Alameda County Sheriff's Department. He's another one that we had him do his shada here as well. So, yeah. Yeah, so there's more more converts coming out of it. <laughs> so, so tell us, so we stopped, Amber, with you. You were telling us that you, you got into fighting. You started yeah. having some success. Yeah. Uh, Jiu-Jitsu first. Yeah. And then... Eventually, you decided to go right. go into MMA, and you basically made it, you know, past the amateur all the way into the. Yeah, so I got this really good, all that cool opportunity. I was at this lower level gym in Hayward, and um, I got this really good opportunity. I was one in one as an amateur, so I had won one and I'd lost one. The my first fight ever, I lost. Like she dislocated my elbow, so I was out for a long time, and I won one and I lost one. And then I got this opportunity, and they were like, "Hey, can you make it to Vegas in five days? Like that, you're. We want to put you in as a last minute for a pro tournament. So if you win the tournament." you can go pro we'll sign you with Invicta and Invicta is an all women's fight organization only women fight on it and at the time Invicta was like the place to be for women you know and um I was like yeah like let's do it you know I can make the weight went to Vegas and they're like oh you have a good showing and we'll bring you back don't worry well I ended up knocking the girl out in like 30 seconds and then came back in a couple months and beat the second girl so now I was three and one as an amateur and I had just won a four or five pro contract with at the time one of the biggest all women's organizations um i went pro in vegas and i don't know if many people know about fighting or who ronda rousey is but she was kind of the one that took women's fighting to the next level in mma um well i ended up fighting her best friend and it was international fight week I was just going pro. We were at the Cosmopolitan in Vegas. It was like, you know, this big deal. And I ended up knocking her out in 37 seconds as well. Um, and then I had a second fight, my second pro fight against a girl named Megan Anderson. And Megan Anderson 
destroyed me for three rounds. And at the time, my corner didn't say anything. Like, I remember people that were just my fight friends running up to the cage, like, instructing me, like, do this, do this, do this. Because I wasn't giving up. I was tough, but I was definitely losing the fight. Um, and after that, one of my friends called me and was like, hey, Coach Kirian, um, his best friend, the other owner, our head fight um, instructor at CSA wants to talk to you. He watched your fight and yeah, he didn't like what he's seen and he thinks that he can help you. He wants to talk to you. And, um, it took me a couple weeks to like get in there and like really go talk to him. Cause I was like this loyalty, didn't want to leave my gym, didn't want to leave all these things. Cause you know, I'm from Hayward loyalty's everything. Right. But, uh, I eventually made the decision. I was like, you know what? I want to be successful at fighting. I want to give myself a fighting chance to actually do well. So let me leave this gym. That's obviously not really like on my side. And let's go on over to CSA where coach Kirian is. And then that's where we met. So that was the first time that you guys were. Yeah. Well, I ended up just taking regular class and I was, uh, the the person that actually got me into fighting, I brought them with me to CSA as well because we were still in a relationship at the time. And I brought them with me um, to CSA as well. So we were both training there. Um, and yeah, and then that's when we met, I think it was just a random Muay Thai class and we met MJ. So yeah. you, do, you, do you teach the Muay Thai classes at CSA? Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what year is that? This is... It's got to be like seven years ago. Seven years ago. Yeah, it's probably seven, like seven, seven years six, Seven, ago. eight years ago. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, it was about seven, eight years ago. It was a while. Yeah. So, do you, do you remember that? <laughs> I do remember awesome. that. Yeah, I do remember. <laughs> I, was like, I, I went up to Coach K and I'm like, who's that um, Who's that girl? Who's the tall girl that's coming and that's working out with us? She's like, oh, he's like, oh, that's Amber Leibrock. I'm like, is she any good? I was like, he, she looks pretty good. He's like, she's good. Should be good for us. <laughs> I was always tough, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Should be good. Okay. Was tough. <laughs> and then from that point on, I think you know we, you know, me and Amber became you know really close friends, and you know we started building that relationship of you know being you know very close, you know, and you know Amber would come to me for advice, Amber would come to me for help, Amber would come to, you know, there was there was different times, you know, you know he. There's also Coach K, and then there's also me. We always play the good cop, bad cop, you know? They and, give me different things. Like yeah. Coach K is super stern, and MJ is a little bit more, could be a little bit more softer. So, like, because I didn't have my own dad. I did, like, have my stepdad. But MJ and Coach Kirian both have really stepped up to be positive male figures in my life that just, whenever I need anything, even now to this day, like, those are my guys. Those are who I go to for sure. So he's a good cop. He's a good okay. good cop. Yes, yes. <laughs> Sometimes. When it comes Sometimes. To, when it comes to me, yes, yes, good yeah. cop. For sure. Coach K takes a little bit more of a sterner approach. You know, I've got to keep my attitude under wraps. But and, and we have to be there because you know we we do get all walks of life in that. You know, all sorts of people that come in through there. You know, people that are hurting, people that are in pain, people that have money, people that are broke, people that live out of their cars, people that have just moved out of the country just to come. We will have people show up show up at our doors that you know literally just move from another country with their suitcase and say, "Hey, I'm here to train. But, uh, I need a place to live, so we have to find them a place to live." So, anyway. kind of like what you guys do at the mosque here sometimes. Yeah. So, what what do you think it is about um, martial arts or MMA that attracts people, that helps them, that helps some people get their lives on, on a better track? Like, I think martial arts unites people. I think martial arts unites all races, cultures, you know, religions, ethnicities. It brings everybody together. Doesn't matter if you are, you know, like I said, if you're if you're Muslim or you know, or if you're Hindu, it doesn't matter, you know, because everybody's treated equally over there. You know, everybody is treated the same. So. And it really does change our lives. Like not only do uh, Coach Kirian teach me how to fight, but they gave me a job. You know, they gave me a job to coach. I have my some of my students are here. You know, I train some of these these guys and gals that are in class now are here with us now. And so they've given me a job. They've 
uh, allowed me to learn how to coach. And not only do I run the kids program there, but they also allow me to run my one-on-ones there. And I, I work with kids or young people with special needs, with autism. And it's a avenue of, um, an avenue I would have never had if they didn't allow that for me. So not only have they helped me in my own life and teaching me how to fight, but now they've given me an opportunity to help others. You know, yesterday was my birthday and I got so many messages from a lot of the girls in my class that are like 15. He did forget my birthday guys. Just so you guys know. I thought he was a good cop. I had a text him like, hey, you know, you guys forgot my birthday. It wasn't just him, Coach Kiri, who forgot my birthday, too. Both forgot her birthday. It's cool. Um, But, yeah, you know, and so now I get to do something. I get to be on the other end. I get to help people. I get to watch, you know, these younger fighters coming up and, you know, these, um, a lot of the girls, like I was saying, messaged me and they're like, dude, you're just so there for us all the time. Like, and when you're a coach or an owner of a gym or, you know, a martial arts instructor, you're a lot more than just teaching people how to fight. Like you are there, you are their, their voice of reason. You're someone they respect, they trust, they listen to. Sometimes they, they feel more comfortable going to you than their own parents. And it's, um, it's a real amazing feeling to, to, not realize at the moment that you're actually impacting people and changing their lives. But when you look at it in like a big picture, like how much you do for people, because what they've done for me, him and coach Kirian have done for hundreds of people just like me. So I'm, I'm especially interested, Amber, in what you were saying earlier about how you got into certain addictions mm-hmm. and that, like, did you do a 12 step program or did you do something no. where you were basically just through just fighting, just yeah. fighting. Um, and I just didn't want to be that way anymore. You know, like I, because of the way I grew up, I was suffering with like a lot of depression, a lot of bad thoughts, just a lot of like things, you know, and, um, being an addict and addicted to things was just making it all worse. Like I felt good for the couple hours, but then the next day it's worse. The day after that, it's worse. It's worse. And your problems don't go away just because we don't like you, you mask them or you don't want to deal with them at the moment. Like then they just start to pile on and I just didn't want to be that person anymore. So yes, I wanted to fight and be a world champion and win and all these things. But at the same time, I also wanted to develop who I was and become a better person. And honestly, like God used fighting to bring me to him, right? Because I reverted in the middle of last year's season because I was still having a hard time, right? So fighting just didn't fix that. Like I needed God a lot to help me fix it. And he brought me to fighting through all my struggles that brought me to fighting. And then fighting brought me to Islam, like well, fighting brought me to MJ and then MJ brought me to Islam. So (laughs) So tell tell us that story. Uh, so last year I got an amazing opportunity to fight for an organization called PFL and PFL does a million dollar tournament. And, um, at the end of the tournament, if you win, you win a million dollars. Um, I had been on the shelf for a little while, had a good fight. They gave me an opportunity. Um, I went to Vegas and I ended up getting a viral head kick knockout. So I was on Sports Center number one, which I didn't know what that was, but everyone was like, you don't even know how cool that is. But, um, and so yeah, amazing highs of highs. And at the time I still wasn't really having a lot of faith. I was still very rocky in my faith. Some days I felt close to God. Some days I didn't know what that meant. Some days I felt like you know, how could there be anything else but just us? And like, I was just constantly like going back and forth with myself. Um, And then I had my second fight with PFL against a girl named Larissa Pacheco and she finished me in 45 seconds. And she, she, uh, the people on YouTube were like, man, she hit her so hard. She knocked her right into God. And it's kind of true. She did, you know, she, uh, she, she punched me right into Islam, but, um, uh, but yeah, it, it, after that fight, even though I was in the middle of this amazing opportunity, I went back to having like these, these bad thoughts and just like these, like not wanting to be here thoughts and just like these dark thoughts that I've spent my whole life feeling like I was getting away from. 
And um, one thing about fighting, fighting will expose you. It will expose your, your goods, your bads and all that stuff. So I remember just laying in bed after that fight and not praying like we pray. I pray now, but just like begging God, like, please, I don't know if you're listening. I don't know what, like, just help me. Like, I can't do this anymore. I'm so tired. And um, that's when MJ just kept being like, please, like, please listen to me. You know, I would never do anything wrong. I would never steal you wrong. Like learn a little bit about Islam. Like, let me take you to the mosque, just please. And then he started telling me about what I know now as Tajud. He's like, just wake up. It's the most special prayer. Wake up in the middle of the night and pray. Just ask God for anything. He'll give it to you. I promise you. And I didn't really know what that meant. And I didn't know how to pray. Like I said, I, I, did not grow up religious at all. So we didn't pray at night. We didn't pray over food. We didn't pray at all. Um, so I didn't know what that meant, but for a whole week I was waking up three thirty, three forty five, four o'clock every day for a whole week, every day, every day, every day. And then finally I was just like, man, like that's, it's gotta be something like, this isn't just me, no alarm clock, no nothing. I'm just popped up right wide awake at the time that MJ had just told me that like is the most special time to pray. Um, I didn't pray, but I, but I was very like, it, like just aware. And then I would feel so like, God, this just feels so right. Like I feels like such a good time of night, but it's, four o'clock in the morning. Like, why do I feel like this? And then that's when I let MJ take me to MCC and then we took my shot. And that was eight months ago now. So yeah, it's been eight months. I've learned a lot in eight months. I've learned a lot in eight <laughs> a months, lot. a lot in eight months. I'm even, I'm even surprised and I'm baffled. I'm like, wow. I'm amazed of, the stuff that she comes to me, she, you know, she, you know, look, I, I learned this prayer. I learned this prayer. I, do, I learned this dua. You know? I learned dua units. And, and when I'm doing yeah. something or if I'm over here, don't do that, MJ. That's not good. <laughs> I you know? try. Why I are you try. wearing those shorts? Those shorts are too small. Those are haram. I try. <laughs> I try. I try. You know? you know, and if I say something, if I say a bad word, she goes, stop, put Allah, stop. You know, so Tell I'm, I'm getting ready. lost so good because I have to, you know, <laughs> keep them on track. So, stay on top of that yeah. stuff yeah. I get reprimanded more than anybody. That's why I learned Tuba too. Like, Tuba, 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 Tuba. Tuba. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah, it's, it's consistent in the gym. So, and um, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it was, it was, it, it's been an amazing journey for her. And I've just watched her, you know, and she'll ask me questions and I try my best to, you know, translate it in, in, in a way so she understands it, not to confuse her, not to tell her something to go from one extreme to another extreme, you know? And I've told her step by step, day by day. This doesn't mean you need to wake up tonight and become, you know, a haji by, you know, uh, uh, by year's end, you know? This is step by step because... You also don't want to burn yourself out. And I tell you, don't burn is, yourself out. Which is actually something that everybody told me. They were like, hey, don't overwhelm yourself. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm overwhelm myself? I'm just going to learn about th this amazing religion that I'm a part of now. Yeah. You know, like I'm going to get closer to God. But I was like trying to use Islam to get me closer to God. And I was just like cramming knowledge in my head. And then I, I just was so overwhelmed. And then I ended up feeling like, oh, I'm not doing anything right. I'm not being a good Muslim. Like, I'm, you know, still like have like these little Westerner ways about me, like habits. Like I need to break them. Need to break. And then I was like beating myself because I couldn't break them right away. And then finally I just had to take a breath. And I was like, you know what, Amber, just go back to what everybody said, literally everybody said the same thing when I reverted. And I was like, and just focus on your prayers, just learn your prayers by heart, focus on your prayers, get close to God and let God do the rest. They bring you Islam, he'll bring you Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Like he'll bring you all those things that you need, but all you need to focus on is getting close to God and trusting. And that's been my biggest thing. Um, 
for the last eight months is alhamdulillah through everything because even though i'm a muslim now like i still go through family stuff you know i still go through issues and still you know i didn't win a million dollars so we're still going through financial stuff and to just trust and just alhamdulillah through everything just believe and trust in god and like he's got me no matter what he's got me and so yeah the last month eight months have been a lot and uh or not a lot but like great you know like it, i feel I feel so much more like relieved and just peaceful. And now like, I don't feel so alone anymore. And I feel like oh, that I have a purpose now. Like before I used to be terrified to die, terrified. Like it would haunt me at night. Like I would never, you know, and now that I know so much and I know that why this life is hard. And now I know why, um, you know, things are rough and I know like what this beautiful place is just waiting for us on the other side. It's just made everything just so much more relaxed and just, I feel so peaceful inside my, myself now. So it's been a nice eight months. That's incredible. So what, we're going to break for a shot prayer now and then we'll, we'll, we'll start back up and there'll be a time for a Q and a. So if you have questions, prep them. Cool. So, uh, uh, again, I just want to thank Sister Amber and Brother Majib for uh, taking time to joining join us tonight. Um, and I think where you, where you were leaving off, I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah, um, of course. You, one thing that you said that I thought was interesting was you said that... Um, Is it me? I think it might be something. Or is it me? Okay. Better? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you said that you were kind of describing like the deeper sense of like kind of contentment or relaxation that you kind of felt after accepting Islam. Uh -huh. But you also said that you're still facing a lot of the same challenges. Yeah. So what's, what's the same about those challenges and what's different, if anything? Well... I guess as like a Westerner, you, you're so um, programmed for certain things to be okay, right? Um, the no clothes, like the very skimpy clothes at like 12, 13 years old, um, the kind of stuff I watch, the kind of stuff like I consume, um, you know, or still also kind of, that's me. Sorry, we'll switch. There we go. Um, and, then, you're good, you're good. and then also for me too, because I have been, because I have always been on my own, that sometimes my first thought isn't Alhamdulillah, or my first thought isn't like, well, this is God's plan. My first part thought is like, how am I going to fix this? Like, what did I do? Like, what, what do I do? How do I make it better? You know? So um, as much as I am learning all these things, there are times where just by habit, um, my first thought isn't initially Alhamdulillah. And, and it's almost kind of beautiful though, because then it does remind me Alhamdulillah. Cause at, at first I'm like, no, 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 wait, you're supposed to just trust. Like it's okay. Like, you know, like having financial problems, like money is nothing, you know, in this life, money's not, I'm not taking money with me. And like what Jenna has for me when I get there is more than anything this life could ever have. And, um, also like, just like little bad habits, like stuff you watch, stuff you, you consume, like things that at, at, in a Western society are so normal for us that when you learn Islam, you're like, no, like this is not like the jokes they make, the, the things they portray, the, the stuff they say. And so those kind of like little habits as well, I call it trash TV, you know, like my trash TV, like you, I'm trying to break those as well. So yeah, it's, it, 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 it's got a lot of perks, but then it also has a lot of reminders of like things that I still need to work on. So how do you balance between like, you're trying to make progress, you want to do things better, but you also don't want to be like, too hard on yourself or burn yourself out or I try not to um, beat myself up, but I also try to list like when I'm feeling really bad, like, Oh man, I'm not doing something right. I try to listen to a lot of prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, like stories or YouTube things. And 
something will always pop up where it reminds me like um, women didn't get into the hijab till like 15 years in, you know, or, you know, the prayers for all five prayers really didn't get established till eight years in and, and like small things like that. So I tried to remind myself that our prophet, peace be upon him, told us to be patient. Like told us it's okay to, you told me the story about one of the companions, right? Who had his own vices and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, never treated him differently. And so I, I try to look for the prophet in ways of how I should kind of think or ease on myself or relax on myself a little bit when I'm beating myself up. If I make a mistake, like I listen to a rap song or on some days I'll catch myself kind of cussing more than I have been the last couple of days. Cause that's also something I'm trying to like, you know, cut out. And then I'm like, Oh man, like oh, you're messing up. You're messing up. Or for me, I'm still trying to establish my prayers five times a day. So there was a, a moment there where I was like, well, if I miss one, I just might as well not pray at all. But then I also try to remember myself or remind myself that Allah loves, loves his servant that repents. Mm -hmm. So I try to ho wholeheartedly just repent, you know, and ask for forgiveness and astaghfirullah while I'm praying. And, you know, someone finally told me like how I'm supposed to like give my duas at the end, you know, I'm supposed to um, call my, call Allah by his names, then all my astaghfirullahs and then be very thankful and then praise the prophet, peace be upon him and then go into, so things like that just, just help. And, and reminding myself that I'm only eight months in, like yeah. I'm going to make a mistake. I might learn something that might not be 100% correct. And I just try to give myself a little bit of grace. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, brother Mujib, for you, the same question. So, or I guess a different question. So seeing her, except go through that journey, go through that, that fight and that, you know, sort of um, difficult experiences afterwards and then the tahajjud and coming to Islam. How did that, how did seeing her go through that affect, affect you, affect your faith? To me, um, it, it, it just makes me deep inside just really happy. You know, if I can, if I can be just a little bit of help, if I can be just a little bit of guidance, um, that's the world to me. You know, and to see her flourish and to see her work her way through, you know, life and be the person that she is supposed to be or the person that she's going to become, that is so enlightening. You know, even for me, it motivates me. Like I said earlier, it's like, oh, I got to, you know, she'll remind me, hey, I'm going to go pray. But, oh, shoot, I got to go pray. You know, so to me, it's also a very strong reminder, like, you know, I see something in her. You know what? There's another person that I see something in too that I can work on that person as well too and help them better their life. You know, so there's a lot of aspects of her becoming a Muslim and somebody else that I've converted, the other person that I've converted. You know that it, it, it's you know obviously you know Alhamdulillah I get the blessings you know from Allah itself, but you know it, it, to me just seeing them grow and to the person that they are really the, the person that they really are is just uh, to me, it's an accomplishment, you know? So. How, do you, how do you feel if, do you feel like Islam or your faith or does these experiences the last eight months, how has it affected your, like your martial arts, your fighting? Um, well, it's really taught me to, I obviously didn't win the tournament. Right. And, and on the last fight, she finished me in like a minute. And in that fight, I felt like I wasn't even in control of my own body. And as soon as the fight was over, something like all over me was like, now your face will be tested because you turn to Islam and everyone was like, Oh, when you turn to Islam, like all it's blood, you're going to win, you're going to all this stuff. And then Allah was like, no, you struggle with your faith. So let's see you have faith when the biggest opportunity, the most money you possibly could have ever made is taken from you. Now what, you know? And I think mm -hmm. that it, it pushed me farther into Islam. It actually made me, made me want to get closer to God and deeper and, and more involved. But as far as my martial arts, it's um, helped me take some emotion out of it. Um, it also made me is, it is making me 
because fighting only lasts for so long, right? You can only be an athlete for so long. And as fighters, we almost identify with fighting. And that's why you see some of your favorite fighters who get close to retirement. You're like, man, why can't this guy just hang it up? Like, I'm watching my favorite fighter just get demolished by the fight because we literally identify with it. It is our way of life. And now that I have Islam, the only way of life I have is Allah. Like that is everything else is secondary. Nothing else matters. The the person I fall in love with, the the money I make, the career. At the end of the day, the only thing I live for is to get closer to God, to be a a um a respectful and amazing servant to God and to, you know, make sure my hereafter is, is something sweet and not, you know, something not. So yeah, it's just helped me kind of separate what's reality and what's not. But yeah, so, so it's that. And cause as a fighter too, you can, I'm seven and six as a MMA fighter, right? So that means I've won just as many as I've lost. And I've had beautiful head kick knockouts. I've had beautiful knockouts. I have like, I have like a, I don't know, it's probably like an 88% finish rate, but I also have a hundred percent being finished rate, you know? So with something like that, it can make your emotions go up Mm. and down because this is your life, right? You've spent your entire last 10 years trying to be the best in the world and, might not be yours, you know, but whether fighting was to bring me to a million dollars or a world title, fighting was meant to bring me to Allah. And that's what my fighting was for. And at the moment I started to convert, I started meeting a bunch of amazing Muslim fighters like Maktabek, you know, like these, these guys who are from different countries whose whole life is Islam. And it just, it's, it's like now, like not only am I a fighter, but now I'm a fighter that's a part of Islam. Like now we're like in our own little group. So whether I win or lose or whatever, it's all, it's all okay. It's all alhamdulillah. It's all good. And which is something I didn't feel before I had Islam. Before it was like, if I lost, I'm a loser. That's it. Like I'm not getting out of bed. I'm not doing anything. Like it, everyone's going to have a bad day because I'm having a bad day. And now it's like... It's cool because look, it's brought me to like these amazing events, like these amazing things. Like I've put on multiple all women sister events at the gym. I'm doing my first self defense here. So even if at the end of my career, because I, you know, I just turned 36, so it, I, there's only so much I got left. At the end of it, fighting has brought me to way more beautiful things and um, beautiful people, and all through like Islam now, you know, like I was telling you the other day, my Instagram, I lost, like, as soon as I started posting about my support to, to Gaza and Palestine, I lost a thousand followers in like two days, but then alhamdulillah, I went up like, like 2000 of just, um, like I gained like 12,000 followers of just the um, like, in just a couple months, you know? So yeah, Islam has done so much for me when it comes to my fighting and that's a beautiful, beautiful reflection about how, like, sometimes we're like, oh, if I begin Muslim, like, everything is going to – and then you were tested, and it I mean, seems like you I, knew you were being tested. I've had people – I really won't say his name, but he's a super famous fighter. He just won a belt, and he literally messaged me, like, I can't believe you as a woman want to be a Muslim, da 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 And in my head, I was just like, wow, like – like you're contradicting you like you are such an evil person like you are like from your heart like really saying how you feel and here i am just living my life trying to get close to god and better myself and it really let me know like it it was a big realization like people who down talk muslims or talk bad about islam or all like they just really don't know like the amazingness that comes from being a Muslim or in Islam or this amazing Ummah that we're all now a part of. Like I've been through a bunch of groups in my life and never in 36 years have I felt more welcomed, more loved, more accepted, more honored, more just everything. than when I became a Muslim and I got to meet like all these amazing sisters and all these amazing brothers are part of this Ummah. So it's been a nice eight months, really. It's been a very clarifying eight months. We're honored to have you. Um, we can open it up for questions and answers now. 
Um, yeah, we can open it, inshallah. There's a brother back back there. That's true. And? Uh, as an athlete, um, what would you say like helped you like get through tough times and like what motivated you to become you know the best possible fighter that you can be? <laughs> through the tough times, which what really motivated me was my brothers. So like I said earlier, I have three brothers and uh, they all go through their own struggles. And my, my family, we weren't supposed to make it. Like I wasn't supposed to make it. I was supposed to be the one that ended up on drugs in prison five kids eight different baby daddies you know and um and so to be able to win or lose tough days or whatever to just know that i make an impact on people's lives just helps me keep going all the time so doesn't matter how rough the training gets doesn't matter how low you know i fighting is not a rich sport. So if you guys are like, Oh, I'm going to be a fighter. Cause I want to make all this money. Like some days, sometimes it's not like that. So it's a struggle. And, but God now helps me get through my rough days. And also just knowing that getting through rough days, that there are people watching that are younger than you and they want to see you succeed through your rough days. So yeah, I hope that answered the question. Assalamu alaikum. Um, so after you converted, how did you build up your faith? Um, well, when things would happen still after I converted, like bad things was, um, making sure that to pray it out. Right. And everyone was like in prayer, like cry to God, like cry. And so at first I was very reluctant to do so. And then when things started to go bad or I needed to have faith, I would even that, like right now, I just pray to God and I cry to God. And then that helps me it really does help me build my faith because every time that happens, something inside of me is like, uh, now you feel that like, you're okay. Like, do you feel like I've got you, you're protected. And I think that every time I feel that a little bit more, like, look, you looked to me, even when things got rough, it, it makes my faith stronger. It makes me feel better. It makes me feel like no matter what, I'm going to get through it. Even if I don't win a belt or even if I don't get all these things or what I'm going to get through it because my faith is growing. And then after you converted, did you ever affect your family? Like, how can I explain it? Like, did you teach them a little bit about Islam? I, I do. Yes, I do try. And um, one of my little brothers lives with me and he's so cute. Like, he'll go grocery shopping and he'll buy, like, beef hot dogs or, like, beef, like, breakfast sandwiches. Or I seen like, I don't even eat corn dogs, but he bought beef corn dogs, you know, because he knows, that, like, pork is not good. And um, so, yeah, I do. I try to, I, as much without, like, trying to, like, shove it down their throats because like I said, my family's not very religious, but I do try to involve them. My mom too. My mom will ask all kinds of questions, you know, like, Oh, why do you do this? Why do they cover? Why do they have their scarf on? Like, you know, Alhamdulillah, like you say it all the time. What does Alhamdulillah mean? You know, you say, Astaghfirullah. My brother will go, Oh, here she goes. Astaghfirullah through the house. Astaghfirullah. So yeah, I do try to, to give them little, little doses where I can. Yeah. And, um, when you converted, since you were trying to also build up your faith, are you planning to, um, sorry, hey, um, are you planning to start fasting? Because I know Ramadan is actually coming up. Yeah, I, I'm going to participate in Ramadan this year. I am. I have not um, pre-fasted uh, until then. I know I have this month. Right? That's why I was asking you what Shaban was, right? Because I just learned about the, the month before Ramadan. Um, but I am. I'm going to fast. We're going to we're gonna do it. And this is where I'm hopefully going to kill some bad habits too of like the music or TV shows I watch and things like that. I have amazing people helping me through it because I'm like, oh, I'm all alone. 
alone. I got no family. I've got people that invite me like, you can come over to dinner. You can break your fast with me, break your fast. So yeah, I am going to participate in it and I'm extremely excited. And I have questions for Mr. MJ. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So, um, this was mainly about when you talked about it first that you were going to get smuggled into America. I think I might have misheard it, but how did you get to America? Uh, on an airplane. Oh. Because <laughs> I might have misheard it. Like, you were saying stuff about smuggling, and I was like, wait, are you saying you got smuggled into America? I'm like, and a suitcase in the airplane. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, uh, we I got we got smuggled from Afghanistan into Pakistan somehow, and then over here, my uncle um, had landed in Afga- from Afghanistan here, and uh, they, you know, at that time, you know, seeking asylum and stuff like that over here. Then they sponsored us to come to this country. So, and the sponsorships were a lot easier back then. And then, um, you said that at one point uh, in your life, you got led into parties and other things that you shouldn't have. How did you get out of those habits? My wife. Yep. Yes. Um, you know, we, you, you know, once, once I met my wife, then a lot of things changed, you know, and, um, I didn't go out with anybody. I didn't party with anybody, but you know, that was my, my, my party partner, you know, everywhere we went, I went with my wife. Anytime I did anything, I did anything with my wife. Anything I did, I ran it through her, you know? So happy wife, happy life. Sometimes. (laughs) And then do you guys both live in LA? Cause I think when you guys were talking, you guys were, uh, you guys were saying something about him. Uh, and then where's your gym? Yeah, it's a few minutes away. Yeah, it's in Dublin right here. Yeah. And MJ's opening a new gym in Blackhawk, so alhamdulillah for that. Like Now there will be two. So there's CSA, the regular, which is like more fight-related CrossFit here in like seven minutes away. And then MJ's going to open a bigger, more commercially kind of 24-hour fitness slash fight gym in Blackhawk. So now we'll have two places semi-close. And then in your gym, uh, what do you teach? Do you only teach like – Kickboxing and boxing. Um, I teach the kids five to fourteen. I teach them Muay Thai. I also teach CrossFit, and then I run the morning programs, which is adult. So it's going to be boxing and Muay Thai in the bad classes, and I also will jump in and teach a little jujitsu every now and then. I wanted to say something on that part. Um, there's a lot of sisters here, so um, you know we. A lot of parents, a lot of mothers and fathers have always approached us and said, hey, you know, I want my daughter to train, but I don't want them, you know, with other people or the crowd or, you know, my daughter wears a hijab. My, you know, I don't want her to be involved in such things. And I always tell them, you know, it's important, especially in this day and age, you know, that you learn to defend yourself. You learn to protect yourself. You learn to do those kind of things, you know, and with us, you know, we protect you that way. You know, I've had multiple, multiple fathers come to me and say, Hey, I really want my daughter to train. I really want her to learn how to defend herself, but I don't want her in, 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 you know, partnering with another male. I don't want her partnering with this. And, you know, we're very accommodating to that. And I just want to let a lot of the parents know that it's a good thing that if you were to get your kids into martial arts, it's very important that you get into because of the day and age that we live now, you know, so they can learn how to protect themselves. So they can learn how to defend themselves and their family. So don't be afraid to walk into a a, a gym because you wear a hijab, you know, don't feel afraid because you're a Muslim and you're not welcome, you know, go into those places, feel comfortable, you know, do your thing, learn how to defend yourself because in Islam, we also have to take care of our health as well too. It's very important that we take care of our health. 
So don't ever be afraid to walk in there and don't ever if if it's not our gym, walk into a different gym and just say, Hey, I want to learn, but I also need to be, you know, not be around the normal people. I don't want to be touched. I don't want to be, you know, things like that as a respect factor. So that's also why I started doing my um, women's events. So um, I try, I know we're doing the first one here at MCC, but I've done a few at um, CSA, which as soon as Ramadan's over, I'm going to start doing them at CSA again. They're, they're completely free and I, I just offer them as often as I can. So, you know, if it is something that you, what you ladies are interested in, but don't necessarily feel comfortable walking into a regular gym, you know, make sure you guys get my Instagram or anything like that. And I, I try to keep it posted when I do do them on my Instagram. So, you know, you all are always more than welcome. And then when is the one here at MCC? It's on Sunday, but I believe it's full. Yeah. So it's on Sunday. I believe it's full, but inshallah, it goes well. Then Munir's going to have me here every day. Don't worry, guys. No. <laughs> Leave it up to Munir. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan. All right. I'll come back to you, sister. Go ahead, young man. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I just have a question. Like, in general, well, what is like the hardest thing? And like, what is the hardest thing? What 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 do you try to become pro? The hardest thing about becoming pro is the is the 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 stuff that you don't see. The not being able to pay your bills, to not especially if you don't have any family helping you out. But the cold nights alone, the the not having enough food in the fridge, the. The early mornings, the the broken down car. I know a lot of fighters who are homeless, actually, and they sleep in their cars in the parking lot. Um, those are the hardest parts about becoming pro because it's something that, like, your Conor McGregor's don't talk about, you know, as much once they get, like, super, super famous. But, yeah, I think that those are the hardest parts. And it's just being like, okay, like, this is just a moment in time. It's not the rest of time. So, like, let's just keep moving. I also have one more, like, how, how, how do you deal with like, the students who like, who, who don't really want to learn and, and, and I still trying to teach them something? Um, well, those ones, you have to threaten to hang them from the rafters by their toes if they're children. And then they usually shape up pretty quickly. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, th you just have to remind them like, Hey, you know, your parents pay if, if they're kids, that's like, you have to remind them like, Hey, your parents pay a lot of money for you to be here. And since you are here, like, let's get the most of the hour, right? Like you don't want to spend the whole hour with me yelling at you or barking orders at you or telling you to stop doing this or that. So, you know, I just try to remind people or even like some adults or teenagers, right? Because the teenagers come to the gym and usually their parents are forcing them to be there. So those ones as well, I try to just remind them like, don't waste your hour. You might as well learn something while you're here and you never know, you might be able to take it with you the next day. You're welcome. So Marika, um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to give a testament to how amazing uh, your gym is. Oh, thank I you. have two of my kids go to CSA. One of them uh, does Muay Thai and boxing with MJ and one of them does CrossFit, um, a daughter and a son. And it's a very good gym. They're very respectful of everyone. And if you're thinking about it, yeah, for sure, look them up. And I did also Amber's women's event and it was amazing. So anytime that opportunity comes up, I Highly recommend our sisters. She's my new Islam buddy. She's been hitting me up like, hey, come with me to the sisters event. Like, you know, like, what do you need? Like, he's been sending me like stuff to, to help me um, translate the Quran and stuff. So also thank you very much for that. But yeah, so the, the sisters are amazing with me at all times. And I'm very appreciative of it. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Amber. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's so amazing to hear your story. Um, they all got you ease in, in, your, in your journey. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, do you have any recommendations for hijabi workout wear or like kind of um, mod dressing modestly in the gym? So uh, this is a new realm for me. I don't necessarily wear the hijab when I'm out yet, like outside. Um, but um, I have been trying to switch from like your tiny little gym clothes to more modest stuff. And there's a brand called Haya. 
H-A-Y-A, Haya, that makes these really beautiful, long, um, like, shirts, but they're, they're not, like, you still see like a little form, you know, they're not like, they don't look like just like long abayas. Um, so I really do like that brand, but honestly, I've just been big shirting it up, like some nice, like loose pants, um, something comfortable. And, you know, I I don't feel like just because other women at the gym don't want to wear no clothes, like that's what you have to do to fit into a fitness environment because it's not true. You know, um, being fit, and working out is not necessarily about how you look. It's about how you feel and it's about being healthy and strong and being able to defend yourself if you need to, and just to feel good in your own skin. So don't ever let, um, society or the way the Western world thinks is beautiful deter you from stepping into a gym, right? You go in there and you, you be your authentic self no matter what. are being funny um okay so i do have one question this is remember uh real quick and i'll hand it back over so you have a public profile Mm -hmm. we have a lot of bullying that happens in public schools here in the tri-valley in the progressive bay area there's a lot of bullying going on how do you deal with the online bullies how do you deal with the comments how does it get to you don't read them don't pay any kind of attention to them like honestly like don't get into arguments online i know like for me because i'm very uh i speak up a lot about gaza and what's happening in palestine and so i get a lot of very hateful evil things said to me or i've been in some like really nasty arguments um or even like a fighter like i said i've been knocked out a few times i'm seven and six so people always like to hit low blow like oh well you should just stop fighting because you suck at it well it's like you're just behind your computer you know um so what i would say is like don't even waste your time with it like young people especially do not argue with your classmates online. Do not like use the internet as a way to socialize or like get back at each other. And if people are trying to bully you online, block and delete. Like that's our motto at CSA block, delete and block and just keep it moving. <laughs> yeah, let's not. <laughs> yeah. Sound like. Well, like so. Are you fighting or are you retired or you, you will be fighting? Oh, I'm still fighting. I have a couple years left and uh, alhamdulillah because I'm no longer with PFL. It will give me an opportunity to fight here regionally, locally. So my next fight hopefully will be in May at the SAP Center in San Jose. So I already told Coach K, I said, I'm going to have the UMA there. I'll you better watch out. It's going to be van after van of the Majid. Just... So, uh, yeah, like I'm still fighting. I still got a couple years left. You know, we want to give give these last couple years a good little run. But, yeah, I'm still in it. Awesome. Uh, just to follow up, uh, since PFL has bought Bellator, any chance to you going back to PFL and competing? Yeah, so uh, I I didn't get re-signed, which is cool because they're going through so much transitional stuff. There's a good chance a lot of my weight class is going to sit on the shelf for a year, um, and I'm going to earn my way back. They told me to win some regional titles, come back with that, and hopefully when I do that next year, they'll have my weight class back for that million-dollar tournament because they're not doing that this year for the featherweights. And, um, yeah, I'll get my, my second shot to win a million dollars. So, yeah, yeah. So, this is a question for both of you. Is there any martial arts class for women, uh, Muslim women and girls? Well, right now I'm just doing kind of special events. I don't have anything specifically on the docket. I am trying to get Coach and MJ to let me permanently do one on Sundays. But, you know, we're working on that. And so right now I just – last year I think I did – four, six of them. And it's something that I am trying to do a little bit more. I am going to wait till after Ramadan, just because I don't know what I'm going to feel like during Ramadan. I don't want to put too much on my plate, but hopefully I'll get something more consistent. So at least I'll have something that will be tailored just for women and uh, girls. Um, the other thing too, like I said earlier, yes, if you, you know, I know we're here, but other gyms, I don't know about, but to us, if you want to send, you know, your female to us, we will take care of them. You know, we will help protect them. We will help them not partner with somebody that you don't want them to partner with. So if you want to send them to, to us, we will definitely take good care of them. 
so they learn the same thing as everybody else does without having to be with everybody else. So we have, we'll, we have, we have two uh, girls with uh, hijabis. We have other females as well too that are Muslim, you know, uh, not as modest, but you know, um, but they're there. So, yeah. Hi, Assalamu alaikum. What's your favorite thing that you've learned about Islam so far? Um, I'm really enjoying right now learning about the prophets, all the prophet stories, which is something that I was always like really curious about, right? Like growing up, you hear like there was Adam and Eve, but it was like, but then what, you know, like, okay, Adam ate the apple. Okay. Well, what happens then? So right now I think my favorite thing um, to learn about Islam is the prophets. And I am having fun learning a little bit of Arabic, even though it's, it's not great. It's not great at all, but, you know, learning my prayers and stuff like that and just like learning dua, like if I learn a dua and I remember it by heart, like it just makes me so happy. So those are just kind of some things that I'm really like enjoying about Islam right now. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I wanted to welcome you to the faith and express how happy I am to see some person convert to Islam. And I also had a... Um, comment and a question okay my thank comment you is, uh, my comment is you mentioned numerous times that you've met a lot of wonderful muslims and you have a lot of new friends who check in on you and ask how things are doing for you i also wanted to bring to your attention that you're also going to meet a lot of not so wonderful muslims throughout your journey you're going to meet a lot of people who are going to lie to you and be dishonest and be deceitful Muslims are a population of over 1 billion people. We're human beings. Sometimes the devil gets the best of us. Yeah. So please just keep in mind that Islam as a religion is perfect, but Muslims who follow it and practice it are not perfect. So please, if you ever feel uh, mistreated by any Muslim, uh, please don't let that uh, make you start to hate Islam. Thank you. I do appreciate it. So you can't see it now, but I, I do have a lot of tattoos. So I am covered in tattoos like my whole face and neck is all covered in tattoos and I get a lot of, well, are you going to get them removed? Like you have to remove them. Like you cannot be a Muslim with your tattoos. And I'm like, well, they're not, they're, they're permanent. They're not going anywhere, you know, but thank you. I really do appreciate that. Cause sometimes you're like, wait, am I, am I supposed to get them removed? Cause that's going to hurt like a lot. <laughs> but yeah, Thank you. Yeah. And one more comment and then a quick question yeah. is the second comment I was going to make is uh, like, if you ever, ever have a question or if you ever have some kind of doubt, the intellectual doubt or spiritual doubt, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to someone who's knowledgeable, who can answer your questions. Muslims who've been Muslims all their life, or even people who have a PhD in Islamic studies, there's been cases where they've turned atheists or they've even converted to a different faith, despite all the knowledge they have about Islam and history and the Quran and its meanings and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, faith goes up and down. And if you ever have a question, please don't hesitate to reach out. There's no such thing as a stupid question when it comes to learning about the foundations of your faith and its evidences. Absolutely. I really do appreciate that because um, honestly, the people in my life, I hit them with questions all the time. And I think that even my questions sometimes get there like it was born Muslims especially, gets their wheels turned and they're like, oh, wait, I haven't thought about that in so long. But thank you very much. And I absolutely will. And the, uh, the question I had, and this is a, <laughs> a bit of a, a diff completely different topic, was do you recommend any uh, general supplements for increasing uh, fighting performance at the gym? Um, it's the way you eat, right? You got to make sure you eat healthy and um, get a lot of sleep, but just stay up on your natural, like your everyday vitamins, your vitamin C, your fish oils, your creatine, your um, things like that. But honestly, when it comes to fighting, it, your nutrition and your sleep are going to be number one. Um, so my friend wanted to ask this question, so I'm asking this for her. Okay. And um, what was your family's reaction to your conversion? They were, they were okay. I didn't get any kind of backlash. I didn't get anything. I think one of my little brothers was like, 
hmm, well, well, okay, like, all right, like, are you happy? And I'm like, yeah, I'm very happy. They're like, okay, well, we're happy for you, you know? Um, but my family is very supportive, especially because I, the way I did grow up. And like I said, like, I wasn't supposed to be a success story. I was supposed to be like one of the ones that didn't make it. And so I think that my family's just happy as long as I'm not messing up or, you know, in dangerous situations anymore. So yeah, I've been, I'm lucky. I've been supported through my fighting and through my conversion. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you as part of the Ummah now. Thank and you. Uh, something that I realized that you mentioned earlier was how now being a Muslim, you don't really relate to like the jokes that you hear, the, show, the shows that you watch. It doesn't really hit the same because you realize as a Muslim how like, and I just wanted to ask how you deal with that and sometimes feeling like somewhat of an outsider, like you don't relate to these jokes, you don't really enjoy like some of the things in this dunya and how do you like uh manage that what is your mindset when it comes to that now? it's different it is different where like like we'll just take music for instance like um i used to love me some hip-hop rap in which i still really enjoy hip-hop rap and stuff like that but then when you just like hear the stuff that they're talking about and you know like like you can play that on spotify but i can't play my palestine song like stop you know but um it, it is it is interesting right so i am still in this kind of new new transition where i'm asking allah to like introduce me to more people who are more um, doing what i'm doing you know so i have been fortunate enough to like the 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 m's that's what we call them because both of their names are marga um they help me a lot and so i've just been trying to to get new friends of, of the Uma and like kind of surround myself more with like Muslims than just like everyday people. And that way I can, you know, talk about the prophet, peace be upon him, talk about the faith, talk about Islam and feel okay about doing so. So it is still something I'm learning, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a learning curve for sure. Uh, who is the greatest fighter in MMA history in your opinion? Khabib. Khabib. Not, and I didn't, I'm not even saying that because he's a Muslim. Like, no, like literally it's Khabib, you know, but if we're talking women, Ronda Rousey. So, there you go. Yeah. So Sister Amber, when you were in New York last year, shortly after your conversion, um, you know, when you do the weigh-in, mm -hmm. you're usually wearing pretty skippy clothes. Oh, yeah. That's the thing with MMA. How do you maintain your modesty in such a female, I don't know, well, in the, the last, the last fight I did, um, not the one against Larissa, but the one against, uh, Marina, I actually asked them for the, the weight cutting curtain so that you, they usually only bring the curtain out if you're going to miss weight. And the commission was giving me a lot of like grief about it. They're like, well, you haven't even weighed in. And I'm like, I'm trying to be covered. So can you just pull out the curtain please? And, um, that part is hard because like with an organization like PFL, they don't really give us an outfit choice. So like if they were going to re-sign me this year, I was going to ask them for at least a t-shirt, you know, like, like something that covers just a little bit more. Um, and yeah, so that part is, is kind of like, you don't really know like how to like, you just do what you can. So like with the weigh-ins, like I didn't weigh in in my, my underwear, my bra, like I normally do, like I asked for the curtain. And I think with someone who's a, a revert like me, who modesty has never been the case, right? Western society is like little, the littler, the better. And, um, so I just take it like small steps, small steps. Like when's the last time you seen me in a sports bra? You haven't since I converted, you know? So I just try to make these small changes where I can and, it might not be the, the, for the Haram police that, you know, we call them on the internet. It might not be what they want right now, but you know, we got to all make it in our own time. Assalamualaikum. I was just wondering how can, how can you manage like b between like professional life and your personal life? Um, well, for me, I don't really have much of a personal life, <laughs> but fighting is, is my life. So I, a lot of my friends are fighters. A lot of the things I do are all fighting. And when I first started fighting, I did have to like, like make a choice to not have a bunch of the same friends that I used to have because they weren't really, um, benefiting like where I was trying to go. So when you think about something like that, you got to think about like your goal, right? Where are you 
trying to get to? Are the people in your personal life getting you there or are they trying to bring you back from there? Because if they're not trying to help you get to your goals or your personal life isn't helping you achieve those goals, you need to switch some things around. So for me, fighting and my personal life, they're kind of intertwined at the moment. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, how is your journey with learning Arabic? Is it like easy or are you? <laughs> no, it is. So I, I yeah, of course, like I said, I get a lot of help. Um, I, for me, just listening to, I'll ask MJ. I have another friend that I, I ask him a lot of stuff often as well. And, um, it's just keep repeating it, like repeating it, repeating it over and over and over again. But, um, for me, like I had to kind of learn like where the sound comes from. Like, you know, it's got to come like deep from in your chest, whereas like Westerners, we kind of talk in our mouth, you know? So, um, that part's been interesting, but I do ask, I have to ask, like, but then I also have to be like, MJ, can you slow down please? Cause I did not hear anything you just said. He's like, what? I just said that. That's exactly what I said. I was like, Okay. Can you not? And then I also have to remember that, um, like, because he's Afghan, so his dialect is different than somebody who just speaks Arabic. So kind of hearing it from two different people helps, but that part's been interesting, but we try, we try, we do, we do all right. So when she asks me and I say it as fast as I can, cause that's how I'm used to saying it. And then she goes, can you slow down? And when I slow down, I mess up. I'm like, wait, did I say that? Did yeah. I say it this way? <laughs> a lot of people are like, hey, can you help me with this? I'm like, uh, I'm like, no, never. Next, another person, because that's not going to work. But uh, I do have an app on my phone called Nazma, Nazma or something like that, which they say say the prayers for you, and then you can read it. And so that help that has helped me 100. percent Like that app right there is. I mean, it took me eight months, but now I finally know my prayers from start to finish, like by heart. Um, but yeah, so the apps help for yeah, definitely help. Thank you for sharing your personal story. Of course. Sorry. Of course. My question for Brother MJ. Um, I know you mentioned way earlier um, that you train a lot of people from different religions. Now my question is, like, what inspired you to choose Amber to convert? Um, I think um, I, it, nothing really inspired me, but I just saw a lot of I just saw something in her where I'm like, you know, I don't know. I, I have this thing about me where I see stuff in people and I usually just go with it. So in her situation, you know, I, I did see her struggle and I did see her and I'm like, she's trying to do something. So, you know, to me, it's like, why not come to this beautiful religion? Why not come to, you know, and if I don't tell her, I feel like I failed if I don't tell her. So it's worth a shot. Were you worried about crossing? No, I never worry about that stuff. <laughs> I cross the line all the time. Um, so no, I wasn't, I was never, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I, till this day, my own business partner, I tell him every single, I remind him every single day he was there. <laughs> I, was about to say, I, went, I visited you guys at CSA uh -huh. and, I was, and he just kept telling his business partner that he should accept the slam. And I was like, you're gonna do okay. it, and I tell him every day. And, and he kept being like, "No," he's like, "You're a great guy." But you know, and I just like with her brother, and I told him, "I said, you're next. I'm gonna get you." So, I do. I legitimately do, and I'm like, "Hey, you're, you know, why not convert? What's wrong? I'm a Catholic. What does that matter?" I, t I literally tell him just like that. So, and then catch me if you can. How did you bring her? Did you give her a book? No, I, 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 uh, I, earlier when she was talking about it, you know, when she was going through her struggles, I told her, I said, you know what? I know you don't know how to pray, but, you know, what we believe in is one of the most important parts of the night or the day of the night is Tajud, right? And I said, please just wake up, just look up and just say, God, help Allah, you don't have to say Allah, just say, God, help me, you know, tell him, you know. That that is a time where, you know, a lot comes down and asks you, "What do you want? What can I give you?" It doesn't hurt. Where when she did that, you know, that I said, like, "Just," and she did. 
Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to both of you for making time to come and for uh, sharing your stories with us and kind of just being vulnerable and telling us about kind thanks, of your, your whole lives. Thanks for having us. We, we both really do appreciate it because yeah, uh, he is, we're in the, he, well, at least I'm in this with him, right? Like he helped me with Islam. Like he is my, my guide. And so to be able to do this with him in front of all you guys was amazing. So thank you guys for having us for sure. Yes, absolutely. Thank you guys all for being out here for us and hearing us. And hopefully I'll see a bunch of you ladies on Sunday. We're honored, Zach. All right, so I can also. Thank you.